I've gotten a lot of questions and comments about the dendritic brass ring that I put together in a prior video. So I figured I would put together this video to demonstrate the different ways you can cool dendritic brass to control the structure. But before we begin, let's do a quick refresher on why dendrites form. These structures can form for a lot of different reasons, but in substitutional alloys like brass, the main reason they form is a big temperature difference in the melting point between the constituents of the alloy. The copper in brass melts at around 1000 C, while the zinc in brass melts at around 400 C. This means that if our composition is in the region of the phase diagram, where no intermetallic compounds form upon solidification, we're going to get the copper rich solid to solidify before zinc rich solid, and this directly leads to dendrites. However, this is an incredibly surface level explanation, and if you want something a little more technical, check out this video. So let's get back to controlling these dendrites to just get a cool pattern. I'm going to be using brass of a composition of about 30% zinc, 70% copper. I found that this composition gives the best dendrites. And here I'm going to be pouring three ingots of this composition. Now each ingot is going to see a different cooling profile. One ingot is going to be entirely air cooled. The second ingot is going to be slowly cooled in a furnace all the way from the melting point down to room temperature. And the third ingot will be slow cooled, but only in this region of the phase diagram. Within this region of the phase diagram, solid brass coexists with liquid brass. And this is a direct result of essentially the copper in the alloy wanting to solidify first, while the zinc in the alloy wants to remain molten. So the first solid to solidify is going to be copper rich while the last solid to solidify is going to be zinc rich. However, what's important is that solidification dendrites are only forming in this region of the phase diagram. Solidification dendrites form upon solidification. So as long as we have liquid still stable, dendrites are still forming. But as soon as that last liquid solidifies, the dendrites are no longer being created. So by slow cooling only in this region, we're essentially allowing those dendrites to grow slow and controlled. And then as soon as they stop forming, rapidly cool the ingot to freeze exactly how the dendrites looked at this point in the phase diagram. So now let's get to processing these ingots. The first one was easy. It was air cooled. All I had to do was pour it into a mold. For the second two, I stuck the ingots into the furnace and brought the temperature up to the melting point. Once both ingots were liquid, I brought the temperature down at about 1 degree C per minute. During this slow cool process, the dendrites are forming within the ingot. Based on their composition, I should expect these ingots to be completely solid at about 900 degrees C. So at this temperature, I checked on the ingots and observed that they were in fact solid. At this point, dendrites are no longer forming. All that's occurring in the ingot now is rapid grain growth and diffusion. So I pulled one of the ingots out of the furnace and allowed it to air cool while the other ingot remained inside the furnace and was allowed to cool slowly. And so after I had all of my ingots cooled, I was ready to grind and polish them, leaving me with three shiny ingots. And at this point, it was time to etch them. The core of the dendrite is very copper rich, as it is some of the first solid to solidify, while the outer shell of the dendrites, as well as the spaces between dendrites, are zinc rich, as it is some of the last liquid to solidify. Using this difference in concentration, we can use etchants to selectively attack regions. For brass, a common etchant is a ferric chloride solution, which will selectively attack zinc rich regions. And so you can see, as I apply the ferric chloride solution, the surface of the ingot becomes a lot more textured. And we start to see that dendritic structure as the zinc rich regions are attacked and the copper rich dendritic cores are spared. And so now that that dendritic structure is visible, let's see if there's any differences between the ingots. The air cooled ingot has relatively small dendrites, but they're very sharp. The contrast between the copper rich region and the zinc rich region is pretty much immediate and there's no blurring between the two. However, the grains are relatively small, being about a centimeter in size. Now the slow cooled ingot is the complete opposite. These grains are massive. They're several centimeters across, but there's no dendrites. Now, if we look at our ingot that was cooled just in the solid liquid coexistence region, we see that it's a sort of balance between the two extremes. It has relatively large grains, but it also still has dendrites. And the dendrites here are slightly larger than the air-cooled dendrites. However, they aren't as sharp. They're a little blurry. 
The differences between all of these ingots can be simply explained by diffusion. We know that dendrites have very copper-rich cores and zinc-rich exteriors. However, this concentration gradient is not permanent. At high enough temperatures, zinc will diffuse into the copper-rich region and copper will diffuse into the zinc-rich region. This means that the longer we hold at these high temperatures, the more we lose this concentration gradient. The air-cooled ingot has a very sharp concentration gradient because there was hardly any time at temperature for these species to diffuse into one another. And so we're left with a very sharp concentration gradient that etches really well. But also we are solidifying quicker, so there's less time to grow larger dendrites in larger grains. Now the slow-cooled ingot on the other hand had many hours of high temperatures after solidification. This allowed the dendrites to completely diffuse away as the grains grew extremely large. And thus once we etch it, we only see grain contrast, no dendrites. And now for the ingot that only had slow cooling during dendritic formation, we have large grains, but we still have dendrites. This is because as soon as the dendrites stopped forming, we immediately cooled the ingot. So there was hardly any time for the dendrites to diffuse away after they formed. However, these dendrites still are a little blurry compared to the air-cooled one. This is because the copper-rich cores of the dendrites exist as a solid for an hour or two before that last zinc-rich liquid solidifies. And so part of the dendrite has a good hour or two to undergo diffusion, leading to a slightly less steep concentration gradient compared to the air-cooled dendrites. And this is what leads to the more blurry look that we see in these dendrites. And so if you're interested in making anything with this dendritic brass for the goal of aesthetics, this is pretty much everything you need to know. While the air-cooled dendrites and grains are smaller, I still think they look spectacular. And so essentially you don't need a furnace to attain this microstructure. All you need to be able to do is just melt metal. So I hope to see some dendritic brass sculptures out there in the future, because I think it's really cool looking, especially when you have an appreciation for the metallurgy. Don't forget to check out the other video in this series where you can learn a little more about the microstructure of brass and get a much more technical explanation on why dendrites form.